Let's take a look at a system that was decidedly not sexy, but arguably the most complicated one on the ship. If you watched the coal and torpedoes video, you will know that there were 92 fuel oil tanks on Texas that fed oil to the boiler rooms through a complex set of valves and pipes. What you may not know is that was only half of the system. We did not discuss that in the rest of the system because we didn't want to bury the message in the details. So we're now going to fix that omission. To do that, We'll focus on one part of the system, which is a single fuel tank. From there, you can multiply what you see by 92 to get a good idea of why providing fuel to the boilers required the most complex system on the ship. You'll also appreciate why it was entirely appropriate to call the officer in charge the Oil King. It's easy to dismiss a fuel tank as a simple storage device with feed line that sends fuel to the boiler rooms. However, it's anything but simple. Let's start by looking at a blank tank, then add all the pipes and devices necessary to deliver fuel. You obviously start with a pipe and you must include a stop valve to control fuel flow. There are approximately 40 tanks on each side of the ship that tap into large oil mains that run between the furthest fore and aft tanks to send fuel from any one of them to each boiler room. Because of their tall heights, most of the fuel tanks provided natural head pressure that pushed fuel into the mains in the boiler rooms. However, pressure greatly varied due to changes in oil thickness called viscosity, temperature, and the amount of fuel in the tank. This was shown in reference cards for each tank that were indispensable tools used by the Oil King. In spite of its variability, oil had to be provided to the boiler rooms at a steady rate. Two booster recirculating pumps in each room accomplished this by providing oil at a controllable constant pressure to heaters and then to fuel oil service tanks. If we look inside a tank, we can see a valve located at its bottom. Since we already know there's a stop valve on the feed line outside of the tank, what was this used for? The first clue is given by these discs on the surface of the third deck. A close look at one shows it to be a remote valve operator with engravings that identify it as fuel oil suction and fill that includes the important letters H and L. These operators switch between either high or low pickups on the valves that draw fuel from the bottom of the tank. The low is typically 2 to 10 inches off the bottom and the high 12 to 18 inches. A photo of one mounted just above a fuel tank in the double bottom shows the separate inputs and a feed line coming out the other side. We'll get into the need for this valve in a little bit. Here's where we literally double the pipes and valves required in the fuel system by installing recirculate pipes and valves to all tanks. Fuel feed lines can provide fuel to the boiler rooms by themselves, but flow and pressure are impossible to regulate. Sudden increases in steaming rate means slow-turning booster pumps must greatly increase their output and fuel pressure drops until they catch up. Likewise, closing burners suddenly decreases fuel flow, causing pressure spikes that force relief valves open and stresses pumps and pipe joints. The solution is similar to drinking water from a hose. If you stick the hose in your mouth and drink all of the water coming through it, you'll either not get enough or you'll get too much that shoots out of your nose. The solution is to hold the hose away from your mouth and sip water as it shoots by. You safely drink only what you want without having to change the water valve. On the ship, boilers sip from the large flow of oil coming through the feed lines and unused fuel is returned to the tanks through recirculate lines. Fuel pressure and flow is made easy by completely eliminating large spikes and dips in pump speed and fuel pressure. Also, adequate fuel and pressure will always be available for even the biggest change in power requirements. If we go back to the tank, we can see a somewhat mysterious disc mounted on the high-low valve. A little digging through old drawings identifies it as a jet ring whose important function will be discussed a little later. Next, fuel tanks have to breathe as fuel is pumped in or out of them, so each has an air escape line that pipes from the tank top to outside of the ship so that toxic fumes aren't released inside. Each also has a stop valve that when shut, along with fuel feed and recirculate stop valves, will allow the tank to be pressurized and tested for leaks. We can also see a sounding tube. While the Fuel King and his crew were able to keep track of fuel levels in tanks with reasonable accuracy, it was occasionally necessary to perform a sounding with a lead line. This could be dropped directly into the tank through an opening or down a tube that extended to the bottom of the tank. They also needed a way to quickly and cleanly open and close all valves from a convenient location. This did not include climbing down a chain ladder to the bottom of a void or swimming to the bottom of a 25-foot deep oil tank. So remote operators were mounted on the third deck to control feed, recirculate, and high-low valves with each operator connected to their respective valve with a reach rod. 
The final element in the tank was a steaming out valve. It was necessary to occasionally clean tanks and the best way to do it was with steam. Hose and valve fittings were mounted on convenient but out of the way bulkheads that allowed portable steam hoses to be attached. Steam was then piped to a tank where it would be blown in. With all of that in place, let's fill a tank with oil, then run through how all of this comes together to provide fuel to the boiler rooms. The first step is to open the feed stop valve using its operator on the third deck, then turn on the booster pump. This caused oil to flow into the boiler room where it was preheated to about 100 degrees, then sent to heated service tanks where it was then pumped through another heater into the boilers. As previously said, only a small amount of the oil was used and the remainder returned to the tank. However, there's a complication. Solids in the fuel oil settled to the bottom of the tank and formed a layer of sediment that you really didn't want sucked into the feed lines where it could clog filters and burners. This is where the jet ring came into play. Beneath the flat plate is a ring mounted on the end of the recirculate line. Returning fuel shot through openings on the inside of the ring and blew against the bottom of the tank to clear sediment and possibly water away from the feed intakes. This not only assured that clean fuel entered the high suction, it also cleared a good path for low suction if it was needed. As a rule, the high suction was always used to consume fuel from a tank. Unused fuel was returned and shot through the jet ring. If fuel level dropped to the high suction inlet, the tank could be refilled by transferring oil from another tank through the recirculate line, or fuel feed was simply switched to another tank. So when does low suction come into play? In the very unlikely case that a ship ran low on fuel, the low pickup could be cut in with the high-low valve and the last of the fuel could be picked up, but at the risk of contamination. Fortunately, the jet ring continued to help keep things clear. Another use for low suction was to clean a tank. At some point, it was likely that sediment built up in a tank to interfere with feed in spite of the jet ring's best efforts. When that happened, the recirculate line was closed and residue pumped out and off the ship. A steam hose was fitted to the steaming out valve and steam shot into the tank. As it expanded, it not only heated the tank, but water condensed and ran down the tank walls. This washed oil off the sides of the tank where it mixed with the sediment in the bottom and all was pumped out. Pumping continued until water largely free of oil and particles was all that came out of the discharge. At that point, the tank was clean enough to refill with oil and put back in service. But what if there was a problem with a valve or a leak that required crew to enter the tank? Remaining oil residue and fumes were still too toxic to permit entry, so steaming and pumping continued for at least 24 hours to thoroughly purge the tank. Once completed, a manhole cover on the top of the tank was removed and any remaining fumes blown out so that men could enter. Regardless of the reason for cleaning, once done, the tank could be refilled and put back into service. As before, stop valves were opened and the booster pump turned on to resume oil feed to the boiler room.